Hello, people of the internet. Hello, welcome to a special edition of Action Words. Hello, hello. My name is Idris Goodwin, he, him, his. I am the executive director of the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center at Colorado College. I am also the playwright of The Raid, which we'll be talking about today. So if you are just tuning in or seeing this as you scroll past your Facebook timeline, once again, Idris Goodwin here, Executive Director, Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center at Colorado College. This is Action Words. Before we get into it, we first must acknowledge that Colorado College and the Fine Arts Center rests on the unceded historic territory of many Native American nations, including the Nuchu, also known as the Utes, who have been the longest continuous indigenous inhabitants of what is now Colorado. Also, the Kiowa, the Hickorya Apache, Comanche, Cheyenne, and Arapaho hold historic ties. We acknowledge the indigenous people who continue to contribute to the existing culture of the Pikes Peak region. The Fine Arts Center at Colorado College is committed to using the arts to expand the story, elevate and platform all of the cultures and subcultures and sub sub subcultures that make us who we are. We do this through the visual, the performing and also arts instruction. We do this in collaboration and alignment with Colorado College, a liberal arts college who has existed and helped contribute to the fabric of the Pikes Peak region for 150 odd years. This series, Action Words, uh, is a program of FAC Connect, our digital platform, conversations and literary arts that respond to social issues and collective conversations. These engagements range from spoken word poetry performance like last month's Action Words, which featured poets responding to the legacy of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But today is going to be a conversation. Uh, the subject of this conversation is going to be the play, The Raid, The Raid, which I wrote. It is a historical drama about a meeting, the third and final meeting between abolitionist John Brown and Frederick Douglass just before John Brown would lead his failed insurrection on the Federal Armory at Harper's Ferry. Uh, in 1858. Some say this was the spark that led to the Civil War, finally. Um, uh, this play was written years ago, um, last year, in the wake of the failed insurrection on the United States Capitol. Words like insurrection uh, were floating around. I immediately thought of this play. So uh, I assembled a team led by director Tiffany Nicole Green, um, and we created a virtual reading um, of the play, um, just to ruminate on, you know, all of these questions we were talking about. Um, wanted to bring it back again. Um, so it is available on demand until the 19th of February. So if you haven't seen it yet, uh, make sure you go to uh, fac.coloradocollege.edu, search The Raid. It is available on demand at no cost until the 19th. Uh, so today uh, we've assembled a really stellar group of individuals um, to talk about the play, to share their perspective about the play, um, as and that's what this series is for. So uh, I'm going to introduce the host, uh, uh, our our moderator, our moderator uh, for this uh, event, um, and then he will then introduce um, our special guests. Um, please, uh, if you're viewing and enjoying and you have questions, throw those questions into the chat and someone will likely get to them. Or if you have um, just some general affirmation or go ahead now or you want to make a point, uh, do that as well. Um, this does not have to be a passive experience, but it also can be if you want to. All right. So I'm very, very pleased to introduce um, uh, my special moderator for this event. Um, Max Schulman is an assistant professor of theater at the Department of Visual and Performing Arts at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, director of both the Homefront Theater Project, exploring issues facing our veterans through the theater, uh, the UCCS drama and, and UCCS dramaturgy. Uh, his research has been published in the theater survey, modern drama, theater topics, theater annual, studies in American Jewish literature, and on howround.com. The man is in these streets, sharing his thoughts, he is the co-editor 
uh, editor of the volume Performing the Progressive Era, Immigration, Urban Life, and Nationalism on Stage. His new book, The American Pipe Dream, Performance of Drug Addiction, 19, uh, 1890 to 1940, will appear this spring. Theater director whose recent credits include Everybody, An <laughs> Iliad, Awaken Sing, Ugly Lies, The Bone. He is a true well-rounded uh, gift to theater in this moment and um, I, I believe the perfect moderator for this kind of discussion. Thank you, Max, for being here. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Idris. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you all for joining us today. Yes, uh, that was quite an introduction. My name is Max Schulman, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, which share in those same uh, unceded territories that Idris uh, uh, introduced. We're so pleased that the Fine Arts Center has brought us together uh, to discuss not only Idris Goodwin's The Raid, but to use this timely piece as a launch pad, as a springboard to a discussion about the present state of arts and our nation. If you haven't already, please do watch uh, the powerful and emotional reading of The Raid, uh, available free uh, uh, for streaming through the FAC website. Uh, Today, please join me in welcoming uh, two artists who are going to speak with us and share their thoughts. Two artists with a keen sense of the political stakes of our present moment. Uh, first, please welcome Betty Hart. Betty Hart is an actor, director, teacher, and advocate based in Colorado. She has an incredible TED Talk about the necessity of compassion that is likely going to save all of us. So please take a look at that. She has directed at the Denver Center for the Arts, Aurora Fox Arts Center, local theater company, and the Creed Rep, among many others. And she is presently, and we're going to get to this today in this talk, I hope, directing Lynn Nottage's wonderful, by the way, meet Vera Stark at the Fine Arts Center. Thank you for being with us, Betty. Thank you so much, Max. I'm glad to be here. Uh, our other guest today, uh, John Cherry, is a photojournalist based in Kentucky, whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Sierra, Time Magazine, Vanity Fair, The Guardian, among many others. Uh, apropos of our discussion today, uh, John has carefully documented a number of protests around the country, including recent Black Lives Matter protests and the insurrection at our nation's capital on January 6th of last year that Idris just, me uh, just mentioned. Please see his really beautiful work as well as his capturing of the COVID experience that I think is so necessary at johnpcherry.com. Thanks for being here, John. Yes, thank you, Max. I'm really happy to be here to have this discussion and contribute. And thank you for the website plug, too. That's yeah, awesome. well, sure. Um, so we three will talk, and all of you watching, watching and listening at home, please write your comments and questions into the chat functions. We would love to hear from you. We would love for this to, to, to respond. Um, Idris offered a little bit of this, but I thought I'd give us a small sense of the play just before we move into it. Um, the central action of the raid. Goodwin's play centers around two clandestine meetings between Frederick Douglass and John Brown. We know in real life that these meetings or a number of meetings occurred, and we know that at least one of them happened in a quarry, uh, that Greek amphitheater shaped space of rock and stone. But we don't know what was discussed. Nobody was in the quarry where it happened. Uh, this is where Goodwin takes up the charge of the artist. Most of us will be somewhat familiar with the historical events related to these meetings. John Brown and his fighters were captured and eventually executed after a failed attempt to incite a slave rebellion at Harper's Ferry in West Virginia. This was in 1859, just a few years before the opening rounds of the American Civil War were fired. The play is about change, its mechanisms, the pains that come with change, and the people who enact it. So, Benny and John, I mean, just to start, I'm, I'm kind of interested about what struck you about the play, uh, about the history, about the reading. What do you take from the story of John Brown and Frederick Douglass meeting? Who do you want to begin? Betty, go for okay. it. <laughs> We're both being really polite people. Yes, you are, yeah. Um, I was struck by quite a few um, aspects. And it was also interesting when you get toward the end, the question of timing and whether or not one should wait also made me think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letters from a Birmingham jail. Um, so that's something that also um, hit me. Um, what is the site of right is a question that was asked. Um, and I 
what I think I love most about the raid, which is so apropos, is the complexity. That on the one hand, you could say that you're fighting for justice, that you are fighting to free people. And on the other hand, you refuse to listen to the very people that you claim to be wanting to represent. That feels very accurate and mm. very present. So I'll start there. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with Betty. I almost took the word out of my mouth. There was a warning about dogs before we started. We were told that I mean, dogs may make an appearance, so we're happy. Well, I think there might be actually someone at the door, but they're just going to have to wait. Um, gosh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, Betty, yes, timing. Um, in relation to, you know, if this would have been a rape that should have ever happened at the time that it happened. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, there is someone at the door. <laughs> And they're dropping off flyers. Cool. <laughs> um, timing. It's all in timing. As Betty was saying, it is yeah, about it's timing. all about timing. Well, wow. and um, yes, and yeah, and about trusting the very people that you plan to hand these weapons mm -hmm. over to, you know, in the first place. Um, you know, when you look at some of the uh, the, the more contemporary political um, dire straits that we're in, um, particularly if you if you relate it to the parallels of what happened on January sixth. Uh, you wonder if the people that had been able to get in and stop the ratification of the Electoral College, if they were the ones in charge, would we trust that? Would the, the people that incited that riot trust that? So that was that was the main parallel that I made. Yeah, that's that. that uh, maybe we should start there. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 that question, Betty, that you raise that I think is so prevalent today of, uh, of allyship. Um, and the notions and the, and the complications we have around that notion of allyship. Um, the idea that, you know, one does not declare oneself an ally. Uh, um, and what my, my, one of my mentors, Monica Ndunu always says is, I'm not interested in allies, I'm interested in accomplices. Uh, um, uh, that she's looking for accomplices. And, you know, we, we, we see this urge by, by um, Brown in the play to to get the emperor to get Douglas to take up this charge to lead these troops that are not that are not his troops, and so I I, um, I, I wonder where what you what you think about at this moment, um, and it's an interesting moment, right? Because we are not in we are not in the heat of last year or the year before. Um, we are in a different place. Um, we are post January sixth. Where where you think allyship fits into the world of political action right now, um, or the world of protest right now, Betty, please, yeah, <laughs> Max, help us out. Just give us a name. We'll <laughs> um, I really appreciate your question. Because, and I want to just start by saying, because I, I definitely have heard, you know, the incredible people who talk about, you know, whether you want someone as an ally or whether you want someone as an accomplice. And what I will say is the semantics of, of choosing between the two is kind of a, it's kind of a moot point for me. Mm -hmm. What I want are people who are willing to stop and listen every single step of the way. Because my challenge with people of all ideologies is that when we believe we're right, every single human being has believed at a time that they were right, only to discover that you're wrong. So if we simply move based on passion and conviction without additional information, we are always going to be in a perpetual place of loss, of um, negativity, of devolving. I really want us as a culture to get into a place where we can say, even if everything I see seems to be indicating this, I can still take in an opposing point of view. I can still take a moment to question the accuracy. If I'm not willing to question myself, then I'm probably not going to surround myself with people who can also ask the right questions, in which case I'm always going to be behind. And I think that's unfortunately where we are as a country. Most people have taken a particular point of view. And I, I find it fascinating because I have friends of all stripes and beliefs. 
And there's a commonality of everyone believing that they're right and everyone mm -hmm. believing that the other person's wrong. And that seems to be what we have in common. And uh, what I think needs to happen is a question of what is it that we do have in common in terms of what do we want? I think everyone wants the United States to be a country that is really based on ideals that though when they were stated originally, that wasn't true. There is a truth in them that we all desire to have. I think every parent wants their kids to be able to succeed and to be safe and to have a better life than they have, right? I think every artist wants to be able to create and create freely and not live a life of poverty. I think every American wants to have a home and have food and have hopes and dreams and purpose. I think those are things that we can all agree upon. And I think that all the other things take us away from these basic truths that should be self-evident. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm wanting to be part of a change where we're willing to listen to difference and not be afraid of it first. Well, I don't know how to follow something as powerful as that, Betty. I think you answered the question fully. So I'm really just going to support your point. And some of the things that I heard within that is, is that for, for us to continue with this uh, political experiment of, experiment of democracy, that maybe to get along, there needs to be some humility that is introduced in these situations. And that's really all we've asked of any allies and any of the causes or the, 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 the strife that we are allies to. Um, is to step into it with fresh childlike eyes uh, and wonder and curiosity. I feel like there's a there's a lack of curiosity. Um, there's a lack of, of of that curiosity that comes with just pure humility when you're stepping into situations that you may not ag agree with, uh, that you might not fully understand. Um, and culturally, I think that's something that a lot of uh, Americans, particularly in the South, look at. They would look at it as if you know it's either written in the Bible, and so therefore it is. We have this fact. And anything that counters that fact uh, is something to be afraid of and then therefore hate, or it's something that you've learned, you know, through generations and generations of, of, uh, of trauma and, 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 you know, mismanaged emotions. And um, I think that, I think that that's the key. I think that humility in this case is the key. Uh, and, and I hope, hopefully that helps Betty's point, which I think whatever I had to say was just superfluous. Stunning oh, God. Stunning One thing answer. that you said, John, that I really appreciate because, and I'm maybe at max, it's where you're going, but I also appreciate what Idris wrote because the play has characters who may indeed be of the same social construct we call race, but that doesn't mean they all felt the same way. Harriet Tubman was very different from Frederick Douglass, who was very different from the emperor. And I love having those three very different points of view about what we should do next. And then the same thing happened with our white characters, right? With John Brown, with, with, uh, was it Harry? What is his name? Henry, yeah. Henry, thank you. And then with, you know, the, I don't know the name of the guy at the end. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, what do you call him? The bounty hunter. We'll call B, him yeah, yeah. the bounty hunter. BH, um, BH, bounty right, hunter. BH. All, which, of course, I'm like, no wonder I can't remember that. Those are my initials. So um, <laughs> all three of them represented something different as well. And I just think that that's the complexity of life, that we can associate ourselves with people and yet not find ourselves feeling and believing the exact same thing. The question is, can we still walk together? And certainly the play shows that, no, we can't always exactly. when we disagree, but it's interesting for how long did their relationship last before that pivotal moment? That's kind of interesting to me. Yeah, it's it, uh, uh, to, to exactly to your point, you know, you have John Brown who, the 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 what seems so deadly or, or or about him is his absolutism, right? Which which is a is an absolute lack of hum humility, right? That's not. I mean, he, he he in some ways he he has a humility in that he is pained by by uh, by the 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 pain in the world and the wrong in the world, but but he's an absolutist, um, which I imagine uh, uh, John in, in in many of your experiences you've run into that kind of absolutism out in the field. Yeah, absolutism. You could even call it reckless righteousness. Um, you know, yeah, I know that a lot of <laughs> I know a lot of uh, you know the violence that came uh, from uh, John Brown's actions at Harper's Ferry were from previous violence. It was it was revenge, or it was uh, it was it was striking back. It was lashing back, and perhaps that's not the best um, emotional foundation for uh, liberation. But it's understandable. You know, the the, the man was obviously plagued by this thing and i couldn't imagine i couldn't imagine um you know this is so you know as a, as a person of color in the united states i 
constantly imagine what was it like to be an enslaved person back then? Because you also imagine being, I guess maybe they could be called woke now, a woke white person that's pissed off and is just surrounded by all of this hate and all of this constant atrocity. Uh, and there's not really uh, a clear cut way. Fortunately, we have photographs. We can see the can see in an instant something that happens on the other end of the the, the world that is a uh, that is a you know atrocity against mankind. But you couldn't do that before, and you couldn't broadcast it in that way either. You know, uh, 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 to this notion of allyship and how we engage with each other, I'm I'm thinking about some of the lines from the play. Douglas says. Um, he says, you have no idea what's in my heart. You may feel for my plight, the emperor's plight. You may feel it deep in the purgatory of your being, but you will never know what's in my heart. And John Brown says, because I am white. And Douglas says, not because your skin is white, but your way is white. And and not only does I think this this potentially raise questions of, of allyship and the, and the reach of allyship, but I also think it it raises questions about 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 leadership. Uh, you know, um, Betty, to your point that the ne the necessity of of um, um, civil and uh, civil discourse and true listening. But I, I can say as a teacher, you know, I, I have been in the room in those experiences where I have seen my black and brown students feel like they have to be the experts in the room. And uh, uh, when we are talking about these subjects, which is an unfair, uh, an unfair weight that they bear on occasion. And, and, and there's so much talk within university systems about how do you maneuver through those? But then, so is there, what is that balance between um, listening and being an ally, but also knowing when uh, it has to be the dominant white culture's responsibility to take up arms at a time. So what, what, you know, how do you know when that moment of the necessity to be the leader comes to play? I love that question. And I think I'll start with the end of it and then we'll go backwards because you had so much in there, Max. People confuse the definition of a leader. And so most people think a leader is only the number one. Mm. I find that more often than not, the leaders that help move things aren't always in the number one position. It's often the number two. The number two leader doesn't have the mic. The number one leader has the mic. And if you use the theater framework, the director has the mic. The stage manager doesn't. But the director can't accomplish anything without the stage manager. The stage manager is the person making sure that everything is working and is implementing the very vision that the director articulates. I think that's part of our challenge in America. Everyone is literally grabbing at the mic. Mm. And so because of that, we don't have true leadership. So in terms of talking to our white audience, I would say it's an interesting question because you could say, well, I care. Do I have the ability to do anything? The answer is yes, you do. But the point is the way you do it. You should not step in front of Dr. King and say, I'll walk across the bridge first. That's not leadership. <laughs> that is aggrandizement. That's ego. Um, but it's can you talk to your Dr. Kings? Can you talk to your Harriet Tubman's? Can you talk to your John Cherry's, your Idris Goodwin's, your Betty Hart's? Can you talk to them and understand what it is we want to accomplish? And then ask yourself, how are the ways that I can help facilitate that? That is leadership. But what I find are too many people saying, well, I know what black people need. Mm -hmm. I know what my, you know, and then you have the different terms of like, do I say Chicana? Do I say Latino? Do I say Latine? Right? Like all the things. Um, but rather than getting bogged into the semantics and what you think you know, can you stay in that place of curiosity and humility that you and John have talked about to understand where people are going and then to support the movement forward? That's leadership as opposed to, I just want the mic, which isn't about leadership at all. And I guess I do want everyone in Washington to hear that. Wanting the mic is not synonymous with leadership. I'll share my notes on this with them whenever I get there. Um, yeah, and to add to that too, um, God, he's blown, he's out of the water. 
Betty. Um, <laughs> so I'm just I'm just so generally amazed by you. Uh, this is I kind of want to like back up into the audience and say, oh, yeah. <laughs> can we can we post questions in the private chat from <laughs> from here? No, no. I, what I was going to say is, you know, whenever you look at a- allyship and leadership, um, there's a there's a call for uh, utilizing identity. I think in that, what is a way that you can uh, it, without being um, in a leadership position, can you utilize your uh, the, the the positive parts of your identity using some of that privilege. For example, if you're um, if you're supporting um, uh, gender non-binary people in in a cause uh, that they that they find to be very important. And for me, I have a hard time not grabbing the mic personally. I love I love grabbing the mic um, and I love being a part of it. But to be able to step back and say what is something within the parameters of this world that we live in that I can give that I can offer that can be uh, that can be an asset to them. And maybe there is something with this male voice. I'm a large I'm a large person. You know, I, I can be I can be uh, I can be perceived in a certain way by others that maybe these folks can't be. And maybe that can be access for them. Maybe that can be I can take the mic and people think, oh, this guy's ready to talk. And then I hand it off to someone else. Um, I think there I think there are ways that that we can all work around this. But I think it does come with having that kind of uh, that 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 blank mind and, and forgetting um, some of your biases, which can be very difficult for for any of us, for all of us, really. It's got to be a constant practice. You have to strive to not want these biases just stuck to the inside of your brain at all times. But very well said, Betty. Thank you. Uh, John, you raised raised this point that today things like things like our camera phones and photography and the work you do as a photojournalist can in a moment from the other side of the world bring us bring us to a place and call attention to something um now one of the challenges uh uh for any historian but especially um for those communities looking for history that that who, whose history was not recorded um, whose history was left out and not valued. Um, one of the things that that art across the board, I think theater is especially good at it, but I'm totally biased. Um, so that's what I, that's that's what I do. But that theater and 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 photography can create is it can fill some of those holes, those gaps in our history. Um, and I'm thinking of, by the way, meet Vera Stark. Right, uh, um, um, uh, you know the, the, that absence that that play fills. Um, you know that that unlisted person on on the screen, who we um, who all of a sudden becomes a full person when before they're nothing but the hand that brings out the tray of drinks. Right, and all of a sudden we create a, a person out of that. So I'm wondering if if the two of you, both from your artistic uh, standpoint and your political stand standpoints, your position as activists, um, can think about what it means to fill those gaps in history, um, and what art can can lend to those to those un, unrecognized and unrecorded moments that we have, the importance of that or the capacity of that. John, I'm going to let you go first. Yeah, I was going to say, John. Okay. Well, yeah. And I and I have a kind of a, a short one for this one because um, you know I'm someone who really believes in the power of the documentary arts, not just in my own life, but how it sways policy and how it sways the world, and it sways people's opinions as well. Uh, um, unfortunately, we're at a time uh, where um, you know the fake news rhetoric is something that's really uh, prominent, and uh, there's also a little bit of something to it as well. Um, so when you look at some of these gaps, you have to consider the source. Um, and I think that you, whenever you consider the source, whenever it comes to, you know, uh, artistic interpretations, anything that's outside of, this is a photograph of exactly what happened when it was, and here's all the context right now, we have to provide a lot of evidence that what we see, uh, in the world with our cameras is what actually happened because we're within a frame. Like you all don't know that everything outside of this frame that I'm in right now is a total mess. Looks great. You have the bicycle. You have the. You have the. You have the. You have the, the chair. You've got the the plant. You know, it's it all looks really good. But what else, what what is what are we not seeing right now? Um, and so there's a certain level of integrity that that comes with um, the, the the documentary photographer, photojournalist, the the drone operator, whatever that that job is, um, 
to be able to give fuller context because you know that the uh, that the content that you're putting out there has this power. Um, and there are foreign governments that look at what we produce here in the United States and it sways how they treat their people. It sways how they interact with the United States as well. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't create a whole lot of art that isn't, um, you know, based in, in, in what's happening right here and now. It's not really something that I can speak to. Uh, that, that's probably actually Betty's part. Um, but I think that there's also a, a piece of integrity and in not um, covering up any of the ugly pieces uh, of some of these stories, not covering up, you know, John Brown, as just an example in this play, uh, is not uh, being postured as a uh, as an as an angel, as a as as someone who is you know acting uh, outside of sometimes you can even say out of his own selfishness. I think that that performance was done really well to show that this is a a man with, uh, with who believes he's very righteous and is very has, has a lot of convictions, but he's also he's also really reckless, and maybe a little bit violent. Um, and I wish that there were more photos. And that's the thing is, you know, we go back 150 years and you can't really you can't really get any real time um, documentation of how these um, how these acts went down, which is why I think wh where we are right now is a complex gift and a blessing. I hope that answered your question. I really appreciated what you said, John, and something that really struck me between Max's question and what you said is that um, when you talked about your space and um, that we can't see, you know, we only see what's in the box. And I think that's really apt because we act in large part based on what we know. And so the history that we don't know becomes a part of us and changes the way we interact with the world. There are people who genuinely believed for a really long period of time that black brains weren't comp you know, weren't 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 capable of doing complex things. We were only built to do menial tasks. We were only built to be in the fields. We were only built to entertain. We were not complex human beings with brains similar to others. That was believed. And so that continued, right? And so when we don't see more information, then we act based on those limits. And then we put those limitations on others and then it becomes standard practice. And so to your point, Max, by the way, meet Vera Stark is crucial because Lynn Nottage asked the question of, do you know that there were black actresses doing incredible work in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and so on, who, because they never became famous, because they didn't become household names, you're completely unaware. And then do you then perpetuate this idea that black people weren't really acting back then? Right. And it continues, right? I saw, I saw a really beautiful meme just a week ago talking about hidden figures and the fact that that movie didn't come out until you know the past 10 years and asking the question, of how many little girls would have grown up to be scientists the way boys did with John Glenn, because they knew about John Glenn, but they didn't know about the black women who actually helped send him there. And so I think there's a, it's crucial that stories are told and that we evaluate the totality of history. And that when we only see one thing represented, we ask questions, what else aren't we seeing? It's kind of like when someone says, hey, I'm going to a city and I want to know where are the places I should go. It's always fascinating what stories you hear because they're the things that are hyped and then the things that the natives know that we kind of intentionally don't hype. We don't want everyone to know about our favorite restaurant. We want to be able to go in and get a seat, right? So we don't want it to be in the top 10, even though it is. And I feel like that's where we need to be as a, as a world asking questions about what we don't know. If everything seems to be this way, asking the question of John asked, well, were there more pictures? Is it that they're just gone now? Mm -hmm. Was anyone taking those pictures? Why weren't they? Why do we have a plethora of this and a, and a dearth of that? I think these are really great questions. Yeah, th thinking about, you know, that, 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 uh, uh, Idris almost in, in maybe an act of irony calls his play the raid, right? Because the raid is actually the only thing we know, 
right? It's the thing that people know. And then the play, we don't see, you know, the raid, we actually never get to the raid. We never see the raid. What we actually see is is everything, uh, everything that happens around it and behind it, right? Um, so I love that. I think that absolutely the idea of, of investigating the totality, right? I, I think what, what artists get to do is fill in the gaps, right? <laughs> um, that's so important. And I think especially for, for marginalized communities that don't have that history, I think is so important. Um, um, and I think there's even even a, a kind of knowledge has done it elsewhere, right? I think about intimate apparel is the same thing, right? Uh, she has those those wonderful moments in that play of the un, uh, 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 un, unnamed woman and man, those photographs that occur, and then she's cre we create this full life behind it, you know. So clearly something that I think with plays like an Octoroon or Father Comes Home from the War it seems to be something that. Um, that people are are moving towards right the arts arts ability to do that. Um, John, so can I ask, <laughs> what what does the revolutionary spirit look like today? You have been on two sides of it. You have seen attempts at change coming from both directions, from from opposite directions of political standings. I, I mean, I'm, I'm painting with a very broad brush, but. When, when, when you're when you're prisoner, when you look back at your own photos, what what are the dominant and maybe they're different depending on whether you're, you know, uh, in Louisville, or at the nation's capital on January six. What what does it look like to you today? That is that is a fantastic question. <laughs> and it's really got it's really got my gears turning too because of thinking about some of the similarities between the powerful personalities that I saw on, on both sides of, of some of these issues. Um, and I think that there are, I think that there are some much larger uh, forces at work that take some of these, uh, what you might consider to be very, very notable revolutionaries and mm. uh, groom them and back them up and then put them into a position where they can be those, those leader personalities. Um, you know, I think particularly to a friend of mine who was, uh, he was murdered, um, November of 2020. He was one of the protest leaders in Louisville. His name was Travis Najdi. Uh, he's a great kid. He was 21 years old. He's very young. Um, he was, I mean, he's very young in a lot of ways, but he was also, uh, highly experienced in the ways of the street. He was just, man, that kid was a firecracker. He was something else. And, um, he was, uh, he came to be, uh, a part of the protest in Louisville. In, in June of 2020, and it was by about August or so that he was leading marches and he was, uh, you know, meeting with politicians and he was very, very quickly sought mentorship and was imparted with knowledge. I mean, he, he might not have had the most historical uh, 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 or the, I'm sorry, not the most astute historical knowledge and backing of, um, you know, civil rights uh, movements that came before him, but he took this on as if it was a brand new project of his. Mm -hmm. And it was really inspiring to see. And, um, you know, he, he faced a lot of backlash too, because he was, you know, a young man. And it, but it's, you know, we never got to really see, you know, Martin Luther King, he was 21, 22. We never got to see these young brains whenever they were, you know, they had this, this righteous indignation, but they also had, they were just dumb. You know, I don't know if any of us at 21, no matter how educated we were, we're making the best decisions. But I digress. He um, he actually his his conviction reminded me a lot of uh, a couple of young men that I saw on January 6th as well. There's a photo, a particularly favorite photo of mine of a uh, it's a blonde, rosy cheeked guy. He could have been 22, 21, 22, maybe even younger. And there was a, a giant American flag that was being carried almost like crowd surf across um, the national mall all the way up towards the inaugural platform. And I saw the way that people were looking at this guy and I saw how they were looking to him. And he took a moment to walk underneath the flag. You know, of course, everyone's on the edges of the flag, holding it up. I mean, this thing is massive. It's probably a hundred feet wide. And he walks along the inside and just rubs his fingers along the stripes as he's walking and he captured that moment. And you see everyone on the outskirts staring at him as he gracefully just rubs his fingers up against this thing. And this is a, you know, 
to be impartial, this is a gorgeous moment and one of the most violent days I can ever remember being a part of. Um, and it, you know, it, it, it makes me wonder, like on two sides of this of this spectrum, how much do these people have in common? How much do they? How 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 do they value their friendships? How do they value their mentorships? It's probably something very similar. I can imagine. It seems like it comes from the same part of uh, of uh, uh, you know human evolution. Um, you know, unfortunately, Travis lost his life and was no, you know, we, we have no idea how his story was supposed to round out or, you know, what kind of changes that he would have made. And, you know, the, the kid that was at the Capitol, very cursory, quick look at, uh, at his, um, you know, gosh, I can you know, almost, almost say like inspiring act of bravery, as some on that side might call it. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tough call. It's a, it's a great question. Fundamentally. What about you, Betty? You know, when Max said, who are the revolutionaries now? I don't get the luxury of doing, not the luxury, I don't get the privilege of doing what you do, right? Going on the front lines and seeing this work and capturing it, which is amazing. And I can't wait to go to your website after this because I am so inspired by listening to you, John. Um, I, I wonder about the revolutionaries being people that we would think are obvious, like activists, but also not obvious, like artists. I wonder also about the revolutionaries who are the parents who are raising their kids in this time and the conversations that they're having that our schools aren't willing to have. I think that's pretty revolutionary mm -hmm. to be raising your child during this time and saying, this is what you're going to hear, but here's what's actually true. Um, to be giving their kids books that are currently being banned in our country. Um, I think they're the revolutionaries. I think the people who are contributing money so that kids can access books that one or two or a few individuals are deciding is dangerous. I think they're the revolutionaries. And I think everyone who's willing to open their mind to a counterpoint of view for 10 minutes or longer might be deemed as a revolutionary right now. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point, Betty. I wonder, you know, a lot of the, the the folks that you that you mentioned, which I would agree, uh, are revolutionaries. What about the people who, on the other side of that spectrum, that consider themselves to be revolutionaries? What about the you know the people that consider, hey, we're going to go and storm the Capitol because we're upset that our God Emperor is not going to uh, win this time? You know, those people. They, I mean, that, that act of insurrection was an act of revolution in some ways, and it's a, such such an interesting perspective to see because I ultimately, fundamentally, agree with where you're coming from, Betty. I think it's, I think it's probably pretty, pretty apparent through my work and my interests. Um, but there's a, a huge swath of our population that looks at these issues. You know, you look at this, this, uh, this, uh, this church in, in Mount Juliet, Tennessee last week that was burning, burning books. And there he had it as, I mean, a big, big giant pile. I mean, they're burning Harry Potter. What is it like 2002? Why are we burning Harry Potter again? And, and you see, and you see that, and you see how you see their convictions, and it makes me wonder what's the who is the real feel, holy field of these revolutionaries? Who are the ones that are really uh, affecting change? Who are the ones that are the lapdogs of the oppressors, and who are the ones that are actually affecting change? Because we would say it about each other, and I wonder where where is where is the room for for any kind of agreement there. Uh, John, I love that question. And I think it's interesting. And I think you're exactly right that someone would call themselves a revolutionary who we might call a renegade and, you know, and vice versa, which I think is really fascinating. As I was listening to you, I was like, oof, that's so real. <laughs> and, um, and I think you're right. People acting based on their beliefs do think that they are revolutionaries and do think that they are affording the cause. And I think what's more fascinating is that, as we know, because it's rare for you to be able to see your time when you're living in it, there are going to be people a hundred years from now who are going to be able to make much better decisions about what's happening now than any of us. Right. They're going to be asking questions enough as in wondering the way we wondered. It's, it's really fascinating to be in a time of civil un, un, upheaval and for us to have looked at other times and have studied those times and questioned whether, you know, you dealt with slavery, you mentioned, or a civil war or the sixties, right? We just keep going down the line. It's fascinating that we question 
who they were and what they did and were they right in the exact same way that we're questioning right now. And so I, I think the answer does indeed become you're a revolutionary if you say you are, and history will get to tell you if you were right. Well, there's such a, the, the, the play itself enacts such an interesting contrast between, between Douglas and Brown, um, uh, uh, where, where as Tubman says of Douglas, he wants to be the blacksmith of America to repair it. Where, and, and so we have this tension between Douglas and Brown where there is the, the do we, do, you know, do we as, as Douglas, do we attempt to fulfill the promise of America, which we may look as Douglas as revolutionary, but in fact, you know, he, he was attempting to fulfill that promise that had been made exactly Betty, as you said in your first comments, right? Uh, making claims to a vision of America that really didn't exist yet, or is to be revolutionary something else, which means to burn it down. And, and I, you can see the calls today falling on either side of, of that perhaps simplified binary of, you know, is our call right now to, you know, you know, a, a Black Lives Matter, a, a, a call from part of our, our citizenry saying the promise of America has not been fulfilled and we need to recognize that versus a call for we should overthrow it all and start with something new. Right. I mean, never in my lifetime, you know, there are inklings of it during Occupy Wall Street. But has there been those honest questions about, you know, are, are is the American experiment headed towards its its failure? Well, I mean, failed insurrection and, you know, 150 years ago is, is debated, uh, may have led to led the to. Civil War. Uh, and, you know, you could say this. I honestly don't feel that January 6th was a failed insurrection. Mm -hmm. I feel like it did exactly what it needed to. It interrupted. I mean, really, we got to thank our good, it sounds weird, our good buddy Mike Pence for continuing the, the, the count of the vote. Um, but if they had interrupted this, um, this sacred democratic process for as long as they had intended to, we would be looking at a very different country. But when you look at the erasure of the history, very recent history also right. heavily documented video photo text message parlor message i mean everything it's all it's all I mean, you could probably 3d map the inside of the capitol with all of the photos and videos that were produced from it and uh but there are people there are leaders that say that what happened that day didn't happen um i don't think that they're completely wrong when they say it was political uh, le legitimate political discourse because in the history of America, we're kind of based on revolution and insurrection. Mm. So it's a, it's such a complex um, issue. And when you sit somewhere kind of like where, where I have to sit, which is in a, a, a this unfortunate neutral position to be able to look at, to be able to go and look at these people in the face and continue to, to operate with them and, and tell their story as their story deserves to be told. Um, it, it, it definitely begs the question of was this insurrection uh, actually failed. Uh, we don't know yet. I think that's the I think that's the uh, the, the key distinction between this and uh, Harper's Ferry. Can I ask two different artists from two different medium working in two different ways? John, do you, do you think you can be objective? Betty, do you think you should be objective? I, I, I think that you should, when you're in this position, you should try to be as objective as possible because people can sense it on you if you don't like them, if you don't believe in them. And it's something that gets in the way of you doing your job. If you can't step in with that childlike wonder, if you step into a situation thinking, oh, I know everything about these people. That's one thing I've learned about this job. I, I mean, just about life in general in the short time that I've been, been here uh, is that people surprise you every day. And they surprise you, usually not for the worse. It's usually for the better. I'm usually, somebody breaks into my car and, and steals my stereo, not surprised. If I fall down, you know, at the Capitol on January 6th and some dude with like a Nazi insignia, like branded on his chest, reaches down to help me up, that is surprising. And it's something that happens. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't really have much of a, a, an explanation for why that is, but in what, back to your original question, 
Uh, objectivity is something that we should strive to be. It's, I don't think it will ever be possible, but I think that it's a good practice to have. I love where you ended, John, because certainly that's where I want to begin. I don't think objectivity is truly possible. I think we're only objective in spaces where we have no knowledge. Mm. When I have no knowledge, I am happy to take in all information because I have nothing. But as soon as I know something, I can't discount that. I think the challenge as artists is for us to, in the same way that I exhorted America to move past that, is to challenge ourselves to say, this is how I see this story. What else am I missing? Right? It goes back to John's you know, lovely query about his room. <laughs> and so um, I think that's our challenge to go beyond what we think we know, what we believe firmly, and see what additional information can come in to help shape it. And then as artists, our job is to present all of that with respect and reverence. And I love John just, I mean, that story just, I love it. And I completely believe it because, because you have a swastika on your chest doesn't mean you're not human mm -hmm. and doesn't mean that you can't see the humanity in another person. It's all about the right moments, right? Every moment we are not our best selves, but there's the potential in every moment for us to be. And I think as artists, we're searching for those moments and searching for the other moments to help us perhaps move back to a place of becoming our best, best selves again. Hmm. Not sure if my mic is picking up the snaps. Here we go. <laughs> um, we're coming sort of towards the end of our talk. One of the things that, that both of you said, that, that this question of recognition of the other side, and I think perhaps what has been a theme throughout this whole talk from our, 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 our request that, that, that we listen, uh, the notion of humility, there, there's a, a powerful moment in, in the play where we hear a, a letter read by Mahala, who is this, this woman whose family was essentially butchered by uh, at least from the from the way the play plays it, by um, who had come to fight uh, for for the South, um, and uh, were killed by John Brown and his soldiers. And there's this powerful moment where we hear from her. Um, and it puts what we typically think of as an unambiguous moral question. In, into question, right? Because it introduces the humanity of the individual on the other side, right? We uh, 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 we we recognize the 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 absolute evil of slavery as an as unambiguous, right? Or as absolute. I, I find myself that I I am easily as absolutist as John Brown. Um, and so I I wonder as as artists and as as people in the world how we can think about that same moment in a contemporary context, I always wonder what price is paid by someone saying Black Lives Matter, who, who doesn't want to say it. I always wonder, the, the, you know, the, what, is the, what is the price that is enacted upon them that instead they have to say all lives matter or blue lives matter? And I wonder if um, I wonder if as as artists that's something that we need to explore right now, or do or are we? Is that a, a waste of our time, or is that the most essential thing to understand? Uh, I, I think John, your mention of a beautiful, inspiring moment as they storm the Capitol is apropos of, of what I'm asking. But how important is it to understand that that what is lost on the other side? I think it's vital. I, I think we have a beautiful fallacy in this country that freedom is free. Hmm. Freedom has never been free. There's always been a cost. And if we don't recognize the cost that takes place on both sides, we don't understand what drives people. Um, I can only imagine when, John, you talked about the 21-year-old who is no longer with us, that this influences and affects how you do life. We have to take in 
the losses. We have to take in the cost. I I don't know the person you mentioned, but it touched me when I heard you say it. And I feel that part of our disconnect as a country is that we don't allow others in to our pain. Experiencing that pain, recognizing there's pain is greater than rhetoric. And I think it's in living in those spaces that we're able to reach people even by shared pain, though that sounds odd, and I don't hear a lot of people talk about that. Mm. I think there's power in it. I think there's power to affect the way we think, what we believe, and to change hearts, because pain is something universal that everyone does understand. So I think it's crucial. I guess whenever you think about, you know, those inalienable rights to, um, you know, just the, the, the very basic things that we need to survive, um, and to and to be happy. What are the what are the ways that we can all work together to accomplish some of those things? Uh, and what are the ways that seeking those things um, and seeking those elements out encroaches on someone else's ability to do the same? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that is something that we have seen. I mean, just throughout throughout the course of, of of slavery and how we read about it in the history books, is that in order for these people to survive, they need. I don't know if need, but they needed to have an entire free workforce of of people to uh, tend to the land. And uh, unfortunately with that required them to strip them of their culture so they wouldn't revolt, uh, draw and quarter their men upon arrival so that they would realize that there's nothing you can do to, uh, to stop what's happening and stop what's coming uh, and just completely demoralize and dehumanize um, and come up with entire scientific branches to do so. I mean, the the damage is so extensive and that was what was required to create what we have now. We wouldn't have what we have now without that, Uh, which is, I mean, that sucks. That, that really sucks. It's it's, and and there, there hasn't been much reckoning. I mean, really any reckoning for what, um, you know, that came from. And I think that's what we deal with in America. We have this massive pain. It's a very impoverished country at at a, at a baseline, uh, I think, I don't, I don't want to say morally, but I think that based off of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a couple of generations, and you'll find that a majority of people probably believed that what happened to our people was, was necessary, that it was, that it was good, that it was unavoidable. Um, and, uh, yeah, it sounds kind of doomsday ish, doesn't it? I, I don't even remember the original question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's all right. It doesn't, it sounds, uh, I think it expresses the depth of what we are visiting and revisiting and visiting and revisiting again and again. And to John's point, I'll just say that because we don't lean into the pain that was Mm. slavery, it allows us to continue perpetuating the legacy today. And so in the same way, if we don't recognize the pain that is in people who are saying all lives matter and blue lives matter, then they can't understand the pain of behind why black lives have to matter and why we have to take the time to say it. So we need to lean in and we need to expose that pain rather than do the classic American thing, which is put a bandaid over a gaping, bleeding wound and wonder why everything isn't okay. Well said. This is uh, this is incredible and powerful. I'm so pleased to have spent this time with both of you. Thank you, Betty Hart. Thank you, John Cherry. Thank you, John, especially for sharing the name and the memory of Travis Najdi and to bringing him to us. Thank you for your thoughts and your ideas. Um, all of you out there, uh, please look these two people up. Please come see uh, uh, Vera Stark. Um, and please, uh, up until February 19th, go and watch Idris Goodwin's The Raid for free uh, on the FAC Connect. Um, thank you all. And I think we're out. <laughs>